All right, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started and we may have a couple more coming in, but that's okay. I'll keep monitoring and getting everybody in. Um, I'd like sure. to welcome everybody this evening. Uh, my name, or it's at least this evening, my time. Um, my name is Kathy Tipton and I serve as the Director of Admissions at Missouri University of Science and Technology. And so I'm happy that everybody decided to, to come out and join us. Uh, we have Dr. Caulfield with us tonight and Dr. Jeffrey Caulfield is a professor in the geosciences and geological and petroleum engineering department on campus. And he's been at the university um, at least as long as I have. And a long time I have been. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we've worked together a long time. And I think that he's a perfect person um, for tonight to be able to tell a little bit about all the degree programs in the College of Engineering and Computing. And I think that he, um, especially if you're in a, in a position in which you're interested in engineering, but you don't know um, what all we might offer or what might be an option for you, I think he's going to be very helpful. Um, so what I do ask, is that um, you go ahead and, and keep yourself muted during the presentation. And then we are going to, after Dr. Caulfield's done talking, we are going to have time to answer all kinds of questions. If you have a question as he's talking, feel free to put it in the Q&A or the chat box. And I'll be happy to um, try to bring that up um, and, and get you you know, answer as, as we go along. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Caulfield. Okay, let me get my share screen thing here going. and start my slideshow and hopefully it's showing up is it Catherine? it is i can see it okay and hopefully everybody can hear me um as kathy said uh yeah i've been here a long time and i i can't even do the math and i'm a engineer uh 1987 so i guess about 34 years i've been here on the faculty um and i've I'm a civil engineer, but I teach in the geological and petroleum engineering group. And so if you think that's a little weird, don't, because one of the things you will learn as you explore engineering and science is that, wow, it is all over the place in terms of crossover and cross-disciplinary um, efforts. And um, just because you are an engineer type X doesn't mean that that's the department or the division or the company you're gonna work in. Um, because it's a very interdisciplinary world out there in engineering and science now. So I wanna just briefly go over a little bit about the summer program that we hope you might consider joining. We have both a virtual version is uh, gonna happen in June and a in-person version we, we're really crossing our fingers hoping is gonna happen in July. And it's called Jackling Intro to Engineering. But I'm also gonna give you a, a really rapid overview of the, um, gosh, I think it's 17 engineering and science programs that we cover in um, the Jackling program. So uh, why is it called Jackling Intro to Engineering? Because um, Daniel Jackling, one of our esteemed alums who graduated early in the 20th century, left a, um, a legacy, um, a, a very nice, generous legacy funding amount to us. And that helps us hold these things like the Jackling Introduction to Engineering Summer Camp. He was a mining engineer, but again, back then they were mining and civil and metallurgy guys, and they got trained in many different things, but he, he was quite the entrepreneur and started the Utah Copper Company, which uh, became Kennecott. And these are probably names you haven't heard unless your parents or grandparents are part of the mining world, but big companies. And we have a lot of things named after him here on campus, Jackling Field, Jackling Gymnasium, the Intro to Engineering uh, Summer Camp. And so he got his start and sort of developed his company in Bingham, Utah, where he discovered this gigantic copper deposit. It was very low grade, but he came up with a technique for extracting that copper and efficiently and economically getting it. It's one of the biggest open pit mines in the world. If you've ever flown into Salt Lake City, you will probably have seen this. Um, so, why engineering and computing? And, and honestly, it's called the Jackling Intro to Engineering Camp. That's just the traditional name, but there's also computer science. There's also geoscience folks involved. So it's not just engineering. It's engineering, some science, some computing. And like I said, it's all over the place. We're problem solvers. We use math and science and, of course, social knowledge and management and judgment. Hopefully hopefully to do stuff and create things and come up with designs and, and such to make the world a better place. I mean, really that's, it sounds idealistic, but that's why we're in it. And um, 
couple, three years ago, the National Academy came up with this list. I don't even think this is all of the things on the list. I just pulled a few of them out. The grand challenges for engineering, and I would say engineering and science. And so you can read through those. I'm not going to hit them all, but most of them are about energy and sustainability and environmental and health and so on. And a lot, of course, in the last couple of decades, a lot more in terms of artificial intelligence, virtual reality, cybersecurity, and so on. Those are the grand challenges. It will keep evolving. It will keep changing. But we need you guys from this next generation coming up, you guys and gals. If I say guys, I mean guys and gals. Um, we need all of you to... Um, get involved. And if it's not engineering and science, whatever it is that you end up doing, we need you all to get involved to um, make this world a better place. Again, I guess I'll just use that phrase. So in the Jackling Intro to Engineering program, I believe there's 17 degree programs listed there. And I you will get a chance if you come to our virtual camp or join us for the virtual camp, or if you um, come to the in-person camp, you will get a chance to pick, to spend some time with maybe not all of them, but maybe five or six of these groups when you are here, spend an afternoon, a morning, an afternoon, a morning, an afternoon, a morning with different groups that you kind of pick to explore with and to meet and to meet the professors and the and the students working here and they'll show you what they're doing in their labs and you can ask questions and um, they may take you out in the field. Um, who knows what they'll do? They will be trying to get you interested in um, or find out what you are interested in that relates to their field and then uh, try to pique your interest. So here at Missouri s and I think we probably have one of the largest suites of engineering and science degree programs in the nation. I can't imagine another university that's got more um, because this is not all of the science. This is all of the engineering and a couple three science programs here. We have other science programs as well that aren't part of our summer field camp. So Missouri s and is a great place to to get your start if you are interested in science, engineering, IT, um, and many other disciplines. So I'm gonna go through those, I think roughly alphabetically, very quickly. And these are slides that the department chair or the associate chair sent to me. I'm not gonna read through them all necessarily, but in aerospace engineering, of course, uh, the focus is on aircraft and spacecraft and uh, maybe even remote sensing and satellite imaging and so on. And so um, you can read some of the some of the areas of emphasis there in their in their uh, words beneath their their drawings and their pictures there. But aerospace engineering has been a very vibrant and and wonderful program here for many years. And it, we have had, uh, Kathy may have to correct me, but I think we've had three or four individuals from Missouri s and actually become astronauts, not necessarily aerospace engineers, but three or four graduates from this program that have become astronauts. Um, I think four, but I know for three for sure. I know Archit three for sure as well. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Architectural engineering, again, I'm going kind of... Uh, alphabetical here, so it's a little bit of a mishmash, but uh, we have an architectural engineering program. It's housed within our civil engineering program, but it's actually a degree program, which sort of interdisciplinary focus on structural engineering with some mechanical and electrical engineering class work. You are not an architect if you graduate from this program. You are an architectural engineer, which is a difference. Um, and many of our design and construction firms around the country and around the world use both architectural architects and architectural engineers. Now, here's a degree program that many people have perhaps not heard about. Uh, it's not typically something that, um, say, a high school guidance counselor might bring up, but we have some very unusual and very interesting degree programs here, one of which is ceramic engineering, which works on, well, a ceramic is basically a non-metal earth material, okay? So it's non-metallic, it's not polymers, but it is earth, earth materials. And so traditional ceramics are whitewares and glass and refractories, but many of our folks work now on um, 
sensors and fiber optics and biomedical. You can see some pictures there of the ceramic engineering folks, uh, superconducting materials, some of the um, integrated circuitry, those are ceramics. And these are folks that are um, working on those, what I would call high tech from nano scale all the way to mega scale ceramic materials. We have chemical engineering, one of our larger degree programs here on campus. And again, maybe you've heard about this. You can see some of the, some of the areas they um, are talking about there. I had to look up this word corn stover. Turns out that stover is basically the leftovers after they harvest the field of corn. And then that, that can be turned into, um, it's kind of the stalks and the leaves and everything can be turned into ethanol and also silage. Um, Chemical engineering, very important to our economy and to our society. Civil engineering, one of the more broad areas. Um, you can see, I think there's gonna be two or three slides here talking about trans transportation infrastructure, structural design, new materials like concrete, asphalt, hydraulics and hydrology. Um, I'm a civil engineer. I kind of got my training in geotechnical, which is soil and rock mechanics. Thus, I work in the geological engineering program here, but there's also a geotechnical group in civil engineering. And so a little bit broader area, you're going to see some of our engineering and science groups are kind of broadly uh, distributed and some of them are very focused. Computer engineering. And you can see some of the emphasis areas there, the bullet points on the left. And one of uh, the young men there that was participating in one of the design uh, competitions. But of course, huge, um, huge program here. Computer engineering and computer science, I think, probably combined would be our second biggest department after mechanical engineering. And they're, they're separate departments, but I mean separate uh, second largest sort of focus area. And some of our students will do dual engine, um, dual degree programs. So they might get a degree in computer science and computer engineering, vice versa, and so on. So um, some folks get minors in one or the other. And here's computer science. So this is officially a science program, but it's part of our uh, College of Engineering and Computing. And uh, many of you know and may be interested in um, the areas of emphasis for computer science. Of course, um, cybersecurity is becoming very, very big, artificial intelligence and so on. Most of us in engineering and science now are, if not really well trained, at least reasonably well trained in computing and computer science. But for the real detailed, uh, fine grained work, a lot of firms are going to use computer science and computer engineers. We have a large electrical engineering program here on campus, um, probably our second or third largest degree program. And as you imagine, everything electrical, they work on um, from power engineering to the grid to um, renewable energy sources like photovoltaic cells. Um, they work on signal processing, communications. Um, all sorts of things. And so electrical engineering, big area, robotics. Um, I would say robotics is sort of, we don't have a degree program in robotics. It's sort of distributed amongst electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, computer engineering, engineering management. Um, so if you're interested in that, you can kind of do some emphasis areas in a couple of degree programs. We have a very interesting um, and one of the few in the nation degree program in engineering management. And it's an engineering degree. You do all the uh, math and science and, and engineering courses your first couple years that all engineers do. And then you kind of go more into the um, management and systems side of things. Engineering managers, many of them will go into project management or sales or safety or quality control. Um, and you can see some of the areas that they work in up here very, and, and some of the companies they work in, if you're following, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but some of these folks have listed some of the companies that hire their grads. Very popular, very, very solid um, engineering degree program. We have an environmental engineering uh, program, degree program also housed within civil. So in the civil um, department, we have civil engineering, architectural engineering and environmental engineering together. 
And environmental engineering has been growing, as has most of the areas uh, related to environmental. And there's emphasis areas in water and wastewater and geo-environmental air pollution. Sometimes we don't think as much about air pollution as being an engineered, but the environmental engineers work on that. We've got folks that are working in environmental chemistry and microbiology in those, in those degree programs. And I know I'm going fast through these things. I just want to give you a feel for um, sort of the major flavor of each of these degree programs, because in the Jackling Intro to Engineering program, you'll have time here throughout the three or four days to visit some of these that are of major interest to you. My home program is geological engineering. We tend to focus a lot on environmental and cleanup and groundwater and contaminated soil and so on. Um, the last decade or so, some of our faculty have gotten more into um, renewable energy, um, wind turbine design and location. And of course, we always work in, I have done a little of this myself in geologic hazards, um, dam safety and so on. So um, the geology and geophysics group, sort of our sister program is a science group focused on geochemistry, geophysics. If you've never heard that word geophysics before, um, it's using state-of-the-art equipment to investigate in the subsurface. So non-destructive testing using seismic waves or ground penetrating radar or drilling holes and doing geophysics downhole, trying to figure out what's down there. Um, because as we're building tunnels or big systems or dams or we have environmental problems, we have to know what's in the subsurface. So you can see some of their emphasis areas there. Those pictures are from their field camp, which they do out in New Mexico and um, Utah every summer. Mechanical engineering is probably, I believe, still our biggest program on campus in terms of number of students. Um, has been throughout my time here. And um, basically anything that is, uh, anything that's in motion, any dynamic system is going to be designed, manufactured by mechanical engineers. So you can see some of their lab stuff here. Here's some of their uh, emphasis areas in mechanical or thermo, thermal, um, thermodynamics is study of heat and heat flow, fluid mechanics, of course, study of fluids and solid mechanics and materials. So mechanical engineering like civil and chemical is one of those sort of broad engineering areas where there's a lot of different emphasis areas that one could delve into. Metallurgical engineering is a sister program to ceramic engineering, and we have them combine in a department we call materials engineering. And it's much more specific than say, I, I was just talking about the breadth of mechanical. Metallurgical is focused on metals. Ceramic is focused on the non-metal materials. And so um, metallurgical you can see is, um, their folks go all over the place working for such folks as the auto, auto manufacturers, um, Boeing hires a lot of our metallurgicals. Uh, our metallurgicals work in research centers with NASA and with other research groups. And so if you think about it, you can't really, you know, I'm a civil engineer, I can't really design and build something until the ceramic, the metal, the metallurgical folks put those materials together and we've got something to build with, right? Um, and so they're sort of at the at the front end of um, of doing any sort of engineering construction or design from small nanomaterials all the way up to the mega projects. And then those guys can't do their work unless the mining folks actually get the stuff out of the ground. And so the mining engineering program here is one of the original sort of charter programs from back in the 1870s when Missouri S&T started as the Missouri School of Mines. So we have a large mining and explosives engineering program. Um, and the explosive engineering program, very popular. It's been growing quite a bit in the last decade or so. And you can see some of the, some of the pictures they sent us about um, you know, mining and then reclaiming the mined land and utilization and doing it in an environmentally sustainable fashion. It's very challenging. We have a nuclear engineering program here. We have a nuclear reactor on campus, which is a little unusual um, to actually have a nuclear reaction on, a reactor on a university campus. But our undergraduates 
as well as our grad students get to work with our, uh, it's a rather small nuclear reactor, but they be, they can learn the uh, operation and safety protocols and so on. And the nuclear engineers work all over the place. They work in many, um, many industries. They work in the um, government sector quite a bit. Many of our folks might go to work either as teachers or researchers for the Department of Defense. And you can see a nuclear aircraft carrier there. And in terms of um, you know sustainability and green power, nuclear power generation is going to be part of the equation for the future. I think I'm I, you know um, alphabetically I'm getting near the end here. How am I doing time wise? Yeah, I've been going for about twenty minutes, so that's about right. Um, petroleum engineering. So we have a, a very uh, solid petroleum engineering program here. And it's not just about drilling and recovering hydrocarbon to make gasoline. Petroleum products are used for plastics and medicines and textiles and all sorts of things. And so um, although we will be moving eventually as uh, we, we do greener energy production, we'll be moving a little bit away from coal and petroleum in the future, we'll still be needing the petroleum for our um, a great deal of what our society uses in terms of plastics and textiles and other materials built from petroleum. And you can see some interesting pictures there of our labs and, and the offshore oil rigs and so on. I did want to finish up before we open, open this session up to Q&A. I did want to finish up telling you a little bit about this campus. It's primarily, and I, I, I don't want to be... Um, I don't want to put too much emphasis on this, but a great majority of our students are science and engineering majors. We do have non-science and non-engineering majors here, and they're great, and they're a wonderful part of our campus. But um, a big part of what we do is try to figure out ways to get our students involved in, in teamwork exercises. And we have a very wonderful student design and experiential learning center where we have student design teams that compete with other universities and honestly with um, other industrial factions throughout the uh, throughout the world even. So we have a Formula SAE car there. I'm not going to be able to show you all of them. We have solar house car, steel bridge, uh, solar house car, solar heart house team. I'm speaking faster than my brain can catch up. So steel bridge. We've got a really large engineers without borders group here on campus, which is not really a competition team, but it is a student design team and they do humanitarian work, mostly in Central America, but uh, around the world, typically outside the United States, but not always. And oftentimes working on environmental issues and water distribution issues, designing, helping folks construct and maintain. So that's kind of a cool team. Here's some others of our teams. We have an advanced aero vehicle team, human powered vehicle team, concrete canoe team, and others. I think there's about 18 student design teams. I'm going to try to show you this uh, short video from our rocket design team. Let's see if this works. And I gotta share that screen. Hopefully, Kathy, is that showing up on your screen? Yeah. I don't see it yet. Oh, now I do. Okay, let's see if we can get this to work. Is that too loud? I turned it up a little. We actually cannot hear it. I was going to oh, ask you if well, that's bad. <laughs> now, why is that happening? Hmm. Power alloy. Okay. It ensures our propellant will properly flow into the engine, as well as overseeing the testing equipment of our engine with water flow test stand and development. Our electronics team works on both projects to ensure all in-flight events occur to have a successful flight. They are also working on a ground station so we can better monitor and track our rocket status while it's in the air. The Structure Subgroup manufactures all the parts of the rocket and makes the rocket look like, well, a rocket. The Payload Subgroup allows us to perform different experiments and projects on our rockets that we can use for future rockets and launches. While the Aero and Recovery Subgroups makes parachutes for our rockets that can bring them back down to us. 
Our propulsion subgroup, who works with solid propellants and this test stand, works to help get our rocket up in the air. On behalf of Missouri s and rocket design team, we would like to say, Thank you! So that's just a, a taste. If you're really interested in the student design teams, let me go back to my screen here. Am I back to my PowerPoint now? Yes. Um, if you're really interested in the student design teams that we have, obviously this stuff's all online and you can take a look. Um, and we have um, information online about our intro to Jackling summer programs and all of the different summer programs I think are out there now, aren't they, Kathy? Yes, and I can share a link to that in the chat too. Okay, summer camps. You may want to come to more than one. Um, uh, there, there's some great ones. And for different levels of students, and maybe you have a younger brother or sister, there's some for the younger kids. I think for Jackling, we're trying to kind of target um, rising 10th, 11th, and 12th graders, pretty much. So um, this last slide is just, you know, what does it take to be a successful engineer or scientist? It's it's not really that complicated. You gotta you gotta have a feel for you know liking science and math a little bit. That doesn't mean you have to have, be a math genius or a science genius. I certainly am not, and I am a professor, and I've had a long productive career. But you got to be able to work with that stuff. You got to be comfortable working with a lot of different folks. So teamwork, communication, and nowadays more than. Even when I was coming along, lifelong learning every year, learning new stuff, going to short courses, getting an advanced degree, just keep on learning, keep on learning. And creativity comes in handy as well. So I'm going to kind of tie back to one of my first slides here that engineers and scientists, we use math, science, social, social knowledge, management skills and everything like it. Creativity, communication skills to do and make and implement solutions to make the world a better place, hopefully. And um, I think that's it. I might have one more slide just finishing it out, Kathy. So um, happy to take questions. And Kathy, if you have anything to add, please do so. I don't really have anything to add. Um, I would say this is a great opportunity if you want. There's so many of us on um, the event tonight. It's probably easiest if you throw your questions in the chat um, and I'm happy to moderate that. I can also include my information in the Office of Admissions in case you have questions about just in general about s and or campus or even some specific questions. Um, if I don't have the answer, I can run down the answer for you on campus. Yeah, I so, can as well. So between yeah. us all, we ought to be able to to either get you an answer now or get you an answer tomorrow. If you have any questions right now, um, either you know to elaborate on some of the things that he already shared about certain degree programs, we're happy to answer those or the camp specifically, or even as a first year student at s and kind of you know, that process and deciding what major, there's many students who will come to s and and not know at the time yeah. of admission or even in enrollment, uh, what they wanna study. So that, that's perfectly fine as well. Yeah, and we will, we will typically have you take a class that will get you um, get you some information much more detailed than what I just did in 25 minutes, some information about all the different degree programs and allow you to go visit them and, and try to make an informed decision by your sophomore year or so. Okay, so we have some questions coming up. Um, one of the questions is, how would you rate the coursework and classes between a hands-on learning environment versus a more academic only environment. Oh, okay. Hmm. Yeah, well, there, you know, there's a little of both, obviously. Um, and honestly, to be the first year or two, it's probably a little bit more heavily weighted towards your math and science classes, like your calculus and your, um, your chemistry and your physics, you got to get that stuff done, or you can't take the more advanced classes where you will actually be in a lab building stuff and breaking things. But even in the freshman year, we do um, try to get you into at least one or two courses where, and I forget the course number, but um, Jill Schmidt in mechanical engineering teaches that course um, to almost all of our freshmen where they build, it's a team project and you build a different, it's kind of a competition where you build a different gizmo or, or some sort of thing and put it together and build it and break it and test it and have some fun. So 
we try to get a lot more hands-on in your junior and senior year. And we try to, um, especially in some of the programs like my home program, we'll, st we'll start doing field work and go out and go out and do testing and so on. So um, it's a process, yeah. How about solar energy? If you wanted to work in that field, what major mm -hmm. would you maybe steer a student to? Well, that's kind of like robotics. It's sort of spread amongst a number of different areas like photovoltaics. Um, there's folks in electrical engineering, there's folks in mechanical engineering, um, and there's folks in chemical engineering, but we don't, we don't have a degree program that's called like renewable energy. Um, you would do a degree in mechanical engineering and then as part of your electives, your junior, senior year, you'd pick areas that focused on that or you do your degree in uh, chemical engineering and then part of your junior senior year your electives would focus more on the on the renewables I would say that probably within a few years we'll actually have a degree program called renewable energy just because I, I just see that's the way it's going so and can you talk about any benefits of a dual degree like a computer and electrical or mechanical and aerospace well yeah I mean there's pluses and minuses. It will typically take you an extra semester or two to get both degrees. I'm not going to lie. There's more, you know, you got to satisfy both degree programs, but then you have both degrees. And so, you know, especially if you think you might go to grad school eventually and get into one of these areas like, um, uh, like solar energy or um, uh, water resources engineering or something that's not really a degree program, but more of an interdisciplinary area. And plus, I think the, the people, the gals and the guys that do dual degrees, they just tend to be very curious about both areas and just don't want to pick one. They want to do both. So, yeah. We had a question about, can you briefly describe the difference between architect and architectural engineering? Yeah, I don't. I've worked with architects in my industrial days. Um, I We don't have architects. We've got architectural engineering, okay? It's part of civil engineering and you become a professional architectural engineer or civil engineer and, and you're actually doing the design and construction and overseeing the construction and so on. Architects are a little bit more on the artsy um, uh, aesthetic side and design side, I think. Um, and I'm not saying that, you know, it's great, it's wonderful. I've, I've loved working with architects but they tend to be a little bit more focused on the, um, on the design and the artistic representations and how things fit into the landscape and so on. Um, I mean, to be blunt, as a civil engineer, I would just build a concrete block and make sure that it could survive anything, but it wouldn't be very pretty, right? And so the architects would be folks and the architectural engineers as well would be folks that would be more interested in making sure that it kind of met the design requirements for aesthetics. But um, I do wanna make clear that when you get done with an architectural engineering degree here, you cannot be, you know, you can't be licensed as an architect and vice versa, an architect can't be licensed as an architectural engineer. It's just a, it's kind of like computer science versus computer engineering, just a slight difference in emphasis. That probably well, didn't help much, but. No, oh, I, th I think that was good. I think that was good. Um, so your geology program, can you talk just briefly on the size of that? And, and maybe um, there's a question about graduate programs, if you offer those. Oh, okay. Well. Specifically about geology? Okay. Yes, correct. Okay. So I'm not in that group. I mean, I'm sitting in my office and the guy next door is in that group. And so we're in the same building and we work together. But the geology folks are, um, again, that's kind of a difference between science, which is focused on the fundamental knowledge and the discovery of it and engineering. So as a geological engineer, I don't worry too much about like discovering the age of a geologic material, but my colleague who might be a paleontologist does. Um, so the geology program is, uh, boy, I don't know the numbers. I'm going to say, you know, 100 undergraduates and the geological engineering is probably about the same and petroleum engineering is probably a little bit less. The grad programs are very robust, much smaller, of course. We have maybe, you know, 40 grad students in each program working on master's degrees. And, and when you go to grad school, you really focus in on something on a, on a particular area of interest, be it 
you know, paleontology or petroleum geology or mining and quarrying, something like that. Yeah. I can probably help with this next question, but please feel free to add Dr. Caulfield if you have any okay. more information. But there was a question about foreign language and engineering and um, probably something important to note to this group is this fall, um, I guess it was last fall, fall of 20, was the first year that we launched our global engineering program at s &T. And so that might be the best fit for someone who's interested in that cross-cultural experience um, of foreign language. Um, but briefly, I can describe that the program is meant for students to obtain two degrees in five years. So they would earn a Bachelor of Science in an engineering discipline of their choice. And then they would also receive a Bachelor of Arts in multidisciplinary studies with a language, and, and I think it's language and cultural focus. Um, right now they are looking into and they're working with French and Spanish options. Um, happy to get you more information on that too, but the, the website is just GEP, like global engineering program.mst.edu. And there is actually a, um, an inquiry form on that website if you want more information on that too. Yeah, it sounds like a wonderful program. I, it does. It we, does. We just, we've been talking about it for years and now we're finally getting it going. So that's, that's good. I, I would just add that I feel one of the major empty spots in my career is that I have never learned a foreign language. I've never studied a foreign language. I never had to. And I've, I've, I went to college for a long time and I got a PhD and I, you know, it just wasn't part of what they made us do. And I feel like that's a, you know, kind of a, an area that I lack in. And so I would encourage you guys to get some training in a foreign language, be it Spanish, Chinese, something, you know, maybe something useful, but even if you just want to learn something for fun. Okay, we have a question about, um, and I think you talked a little bit about the research opportunities, but the main question is looking at undergraduates versus graduates. Do graduates have priority? Can undergraduates, you know, get in there in the first year? On research projects? Yeah, like research projects and labs. Yeah, well, we have a really, um, I probably use this word too much, a really robust, we have a really solid um, undergraduate research program here on campus. And so, um, look, the, the pragmatic reason is we have probably, what's our enrollment now, Kathy, 7,000-ish, 7,500? Right. And probably 5,000 of that is undergraduates, right? So we we as professors use our undergraduates and utilize them and they get an opportunity to work in our labs simply because we don't have enough grad students typically. And it's a great way for our undergrads to get into it and, and, and learn about it. Some of our undergrads just love it and then they might stay for a master's or a PhD and some of them learn that they don't really want to do research and that's great too. You got to learn those things. So it's, it's not that the grad students have priority. Um, I think both groups have <laughs> priority. Yeah. I'm kind of scrolling down, just trying to see if I can get. I saw something about, is Jackling an option for an incoming freshman, not a rising senior, but an incoming freshman? And I mean, typically we don't see, I mean, I'm not going to tell anybody they can't come. Um, I don't know. What do you think, Kathy? It's, it's a little unusual to have a incoming yeah. freshman come, but. Certainly. Would they get any, would they get any, um, exposure during hit the ground running? They would, they would. So there's other programs, bridge program called hit the ground running. And then your first semester or yeah, your first semester here, you're going to get exposure through the foundational engineering program. You'll have to take a class, um, uh, once a week, you'll meet and go and visit departments and so on. So I would say, yeah, yeah, it's an option. You could you could apply and come, but I'm I'm not sure. You might be better off just waiting for that first semester class. But that's up to you. Okay, I don't think we're going to get to all the questions, so I'll have to probably find a way to um, provide those answers to everyone later, but I would, I did see a question about is this recorded, it is recorded and it will be shared, so if you're a registrant, you would be the first to find it because we will actually send it to you here in a couple days, um, but we'll also have it on our admissions uh, YouTube channel as well, so you'll be able to find it that way, but we will send you the link as soon as we are able to edit it and send that out. Um, let's see, am I missing anything else? We have a lot of questions about rating our engineering programs. I mean, I'm sure that there's obviously organizations who do that. 
Um, I don't know probably, if I can it enough to rate them. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was, yeah, I don't know off the top of my head, but um, some of them are ranked by, oh, like Princeton Review and others. If you go to the department websites, probably they might have something about that on their websites. And if not, you could email them because I guarantee you those department chairs know how they're ranked. Yeah, agreed. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, another question was about class sizes and I can, I can start, but obviously Dr. Crawford might know best, but yes, um, typically your class sizes do become smaller as you progress through your major. Um, there are some classes early on, I believe what it's probably your calculus and physics. Would you say Dr. Caulfield's your, your largest probably coming in? Yeah. And actually I teach one that's pretty big. It's the intro to engine, uh, intro to geology for civil engineers, geological engineers, petroleum, you know, I'll have a hundred kids in that class. And that's mostly freshman and sophomore, but um, we have labs where that we break them out into 15 once a week. So usually with those big classes, there's labs where you do a lot of hands-on work and it's in a smaller, more intimate setting. But yeah, I'd say Calc 1, Chemistry 1 is probably our biggest lecture. Boy, I don't know. Chemistry 1, Physics 1, I don't know. That's not the right numbers. They have official numbers. I'm just <laughs> first semester chemistry, first semester physics. But again, there's going to be labs where you break out and uh, you do hands-on and work on the homework. I Maybe it if I can, Kathy, we also have these wonderful tutoring programs called LEAD and and um, also sometimes the faculty will put together tutoring programs with their graduate students where you can work maybe not one-on-one, -on -one, but, you know, in small groups um, on homeworks and stuff for almost all of the first year, probably most of the first year and second year classes that we have. And I would also add, if, if you are a senior and you feel like you're running out of time and you have questions about specific departments, um, we do have in-person visits. Uh, we also can set up a virtual visit if that's more um, convenient or, or that's what maybe you're more comfortable with. Um, so if you just let our visit center know, we can obviously connect you with the right person, whether it be a, a faculty member or if you want to talk to a current student in the program, we can do that too. Yeah. Um, Okay, well, I, I think we're going to close. I know we're at the end of our program. I know maybe there are still some questions that are left unanswered. So I will put my contact information again in the chat, um, just so everybody has it kind of fresh on, on their chat. Um, but if anybody has any questions, please do follow up. We're happy to help you. And I appreciate Dr. Caulfield being here this evening to help us um, learn more about the different programs and what really Yeah, does. my pleasure. And if you, uh, Kathy, if you get questions that maybe I can answer better than you or whatever, just send them to me and I'll, I'll get back with you. Happy to help. All right. Um, hope everybody has. I saw a question just now about SATs required, not required. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. So if you are a first time freshman student who's applying to fall of 21 or fall of 22, um, there are two different options um, to apply for admission. So you can apply uh, utilizing your test score, which would be an ACT or an SAT super score, or you can apply um, what, what many people call test optional, um, not utilizing your test score. So it's pretty simple um, to do through the Common App or through our um, s and app. Uh, there's a question um, that you just say if you want to be test optional or not. Um, those students who are evaluated on the test optional process, we look at your um, a variety of, of, of data points, but one, two, two main differences is we are looking at um, a couple of questions that we have you um, submit that are additional that are talking about extracurricular activities and also your um, com uh, your contribution to the ST community. And then also secondly, uh, second, we are looking at your um, not your cumulative GPA, but your core GPA. So that's going to be looking at that core curriculum courses like your English, your math, social studies, and so forth. So if, again, have questions about that, feel free to email or call me. All right. Um, with that, good to go. Dr. Thanks, Coffey? everybody. Hope okay. to see some of you this summer. It'd be Thank a pleasure you. to get to meet you. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Good night.